Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stephen Miller, and I'm going to give you a talk about race car uh, uh, engine plumbing and wiring. Um, as a good presenter, a presenter is supposed to start the presentation with a story. And I found one in my files. In my previous job, I used to do a lot of traveling. And um, I spent a week in Winnipeg one time. I hope there's nobody here from Winnipeg, on t uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba. But it struck me kind of funny, this particular elevator, in that this sign was kind of unusual because it was way up above the door opening. And when I took a closer look, I saw this, <laughs> which is the fireman's elevator. But the part that intrigued me was the Braille. So I actually went to the front desk and asked how the short blind fireman find the elevator. And when it comes to detailing model racing cars for plumbing and wiring, this is the way I felt back in 1985 when I came back into modeling to start doing that. And what I want to share with you, obviously I'm not going to be able to tell you everything I've learned in the last 14 or 15 years, but uh, I'll share some things at least maybe hopefully on how to find stuff. Anyways, what we're going to talk about is wiring and plumbing fundamentals for detailing racing cars. And to do that, I mean, this is the typical, if you're lucky enough to get a photograph like this of a racing car, <coughs> um, there's a lot of spaghetti there. And what happens is you say, well, OK, I'd really like to, to model that and get some of that detail in. And I don't know whether you can see it here, but what intrigued me about this particular car was there's a, a wire coming down here to the coil on the spark plug, um, which is fine. Uh, all spark plugs need coils. But there was this other silver wire here that I could never figure out what that was for. And I happened to read uh, a particular article in a magazine or a, a book somewhere else. And that particular wire, wire is actually for the pressure transducer that measures combustion pressure while the engine's running. Okay, So there's lots of little wires in there for lots of little different things. And you can model a car and paint it so that it looks like in the photograph. But I think from some of the things that we've seen on the table out there, if you wire and plumb it, it adds quite a bit to the, uh, the genre of the particular model. And you can see here, I didn't forget the little silver wire for the pressure transducer. So when we get down to detailing model racing cars, uh, we need to think of it as well in terms of detailing as an investment. And also as it's an investment in the display of, of our modeling skill. And if you look at some of the investments, and don't ever let your wife look at this slide, because uh, we're talking about things like a model kit for about $30, if we're lucky. Uh, templated carbon fiber decals, another $20. And then uh, sometimes you need some extra ones, so you got to go for that. And a little bit of photo etch, maybe one sheet. And of course, some wires, of course, if we're going to do detailing. And also some turned aluminum fittings. And is anybody keeping score here yet? A uh, little bit of paint for 20 bucks. <coughs> and some reference material. And reference material is not inexpensive if you can find what you're looking for. And that's $188 right there. OK? Now, this is the next part. How about the hours? Free. I, I don't, I don't, I don't do any personal activities for any less dollars than what I work, get paid at work, <laughs> OK? Because that's, uh, so when I look at gauging my time and trying to decide uh, what the value of my time is, if somebody else is willing to pay me something for it, why should I, why should I accept less for myself for it? So anyways, how about the hours? So we have some investments. Now, uh, one of the key things about GSL is, is the whole idea of model craftsmanship and basic craftsmanship and finish head the list of modeling fundamentals. But technical accuracy of your model is also an important quality in the modeling, model building. And it provides an additional challenge to the build process. And I'll give you an example. Uh, some people may have seen the land speed record car out there with the twin turbines. Well, I've 
been interested in turbines since Lotus ran them at uh, Indianapolis in 1968, but I'd never actually delved into trying to figure out exactly how they worked. So I went off to the, uh, the local Aero Museum and I managed to actually get a copy of a maintenance manual for the turbine. So I have lots of reference material that I can go through and understand exactly how all the systems in the turbine work. And that's part of my building process. Uh, usually about 50% of my time is spent referencing the material for the, for the build. It also creates an opportunity for you to develop your automotive knowledge as you strive for accuracy. So what's the objective of this presentation? Well, it's to review some of the fundamentals of racing car techniques and components and uh, elevate our appreciation of race vehicle operating systems and also approve, prove our awareness of what to look for in reference material. And that's sometimes the hardest part is you see things, but you may not know what they are or what they're connected to or what contribution they actually make to being there. So the topics we're going to look at is cooling systems, lubrication, engine management, which is uh, now very much a part of race vehicles. In fact, it's, uh, passenger cars often have much more sophisticated engine technology in them sometimes than what uh, racing cars do. Uh, wiring and connectors, turbocharging, brakes, suspension, bit on hoses and fittings, and then this is one of the few presentations where we're actually going to have a test at the end. So a word about standard layouts. A lot of people think that racing cars have standard layouts, and to a certain extent that is true. Like if you go into the Ferrari garage, there is a standard layout for the car. That's one of the, th the key things as you go up the ladder of, uh, of motorsport is that the, uh, the quality of preparation increases dramatically. And yes, there are things such as standard layouts. However, depending on where you are on the, on the ladder, there may not necessarily be such a thing because all layouts are the subject to the individual interpretation of the teams and mechanics that maintain the cars. So from race to race, there are things that are varied quite dramatically. And I know that in Formula One, for instance, they actually design new pieces for each race. Uh, and guess what? As I said, they can change from race to race. So if we start with uh, cooling systems, I'm just going to give you some basic layouts. I have some different kinds of things to look at here. But the key thing as we go through these is you want to look for, okay, let's feel comfortable. We all know a car has a radiator and hoses and, and stuff, but where are they connected to? And this particular example I have, these are uh, examples of, uh, of Cosworth uh, V8 um, XB type engines from a late model uh, uh, IndyCar. And of course, we're going to have to have a couple radiators for that. And coolant. always goes in the bottom of the block and fills up towards the top and at some point at the top and it may be at the top of the block or it may be down at the side here because it's routed down and what I mean by that is if this is our V8 okay coolant comes in to a lot of racing engines at the pumps down here goes up through the block may go right up to the top here but the tubes come down to the side here to exit for the purposes of uh, packaging, okay? And we make the rest of our block fill up here to the other side, so we have both our radiators fill, okay? Um, as I said, it comes out the top, and the top of our normal radiator in our car is actually a header tank, but in most racing vehicles, the header tank could be located in a completely different place from where the, uh, from where the actual engine is. Formula One cars, they can be tubular devices sitting down on the side of the side, side pods beside the radiator where the, uh, the electronics boxes are. Or in an Indy car, this particular one happens to be sitting at the top of the firewall. Okay? And we have to have venting back to the, to the header tank to allow steam, any steam, that, steam trap points in the, in the cooling system to to actually accumulate and rise to the top of the system, otherwise you get air locks. Does anybody have any idea what these little round guys are here? No, nope, those are what they call swirl pots. And what they do is the, uh, the coolant line comes into the swirl pot tangentially and causes the coolant to spin so that it uh, 
works the bubbles out, and then they usually have a vent line that takes the steam, any bubbles that are, that are formed back up to the header tank so they can be uh, up into the top of the radiator. Okay, so they're not in the loop. Okay. Places like the front corners of the radiators here, anywhere where you get a high point is a, is a place where you could have a, uh, a vent line that goes back to the header tank. And one other place there's usually a vent line as well is off the top of the, of the water pump to go back which isn't really that much different than you have on a, on a standard engine that we have. There's the one that comes out the top of the block. Okay. So any questions about that? Okay. Lubrication systems. Um, here's some, uh, uh, obviously, a looks like a Chevrolet block, but we have our, our uh, multi-stage uh, dry sump pump here. Uh, most racing engines use dry sump systems simply because if the oil was left in the crankcase when we were driving around a track, whether it was left hand or right hand or an oval, the oil would be sloshed to the one side or whatever, the uphill side or the, the high g-force side. So on, a, on a, an oval track turning left, it would be sloshed to the right hand side of the car by centrifugal forces. So they, they, they have developed over the years these, these dry sump systems where there actually isn't any oil in the crankcase. It's all actually located in a dry sump uh, lubrication reservoir, which can be somewhere else, it's obviously somewhere else in the car, and it depends on what type of racing you're talking about as to where it is. Uh, stock cars, they put them in the trunk, they put them behind the back seat. Uh, formula cars for many years put them in the bell housing between the gearbox and the engine. And, uh, but recently in Formula One and in Champ Car IndyCar racing, they've actually moved into the firewall just ahead of the engine block. There's a little cavity in there where the, where the, uh, the uh, oil reservoir sits. So let's bring our pump down from the engine so we can see it a little bit better. And you've probably seen these diagrams in a variety of different publications. You have to be very careful when you look at them, though, because not all of them have managed to connect the hoses up correctly. So sometimes they won't actually work when you look at them. And that's part of the, what this uh, discussion is all about, is to make things look like they work. So if we fill our reservoir with oil, obviously we have to get it into our engine. And can you see? Okay. Um, so one of the stages, this happens to be a five-stage pump. You can see the five AN fittings here on the pump. One of the stages is designated for delivery of the oil to the engine through the filter. And in the case of a Chevrolet engine, it often goes in where the filter spins on. But not necessarily. It can also go in any, any place in the oil gallery where you can get a fitting plugged into the oil gallery is another uh, location and we'll see something about that later on in the presentation. So once our oil goes through the, through the engine, um, we have to get it out and back to the reservoir because we don't want it to stay in the engine. In addition to um, you know, the sloshing effects that you want to avoid, the oil actually acts as an energy consumer. So it can actually draw power from the engine and you might say, well, how can it be that much? Well, it's significant enough that oil companies spend millions of dollars trying to deliver low viscosity engine oils to both racing and the consumer to assist with that kind of thing in either term producing power or fuel economy. So to evacuate the oil, uh, we have pickups in the crankcase that pick up the oil, and the other stages of the pump are designed to do that. Um, on a stock car engine, for instance, driving around a left-hand curve, the pickup points are on the right side of the engine, primarily. And you want to have one at the front, one at the back, and one at the middle. Anybody have any idea what that's for? Because of acceleration, deceleration? Perfect. Exactly. Now, if you're on a road course where you're doing both left and right turns, sometimes they'll put, if, it, we're, if most of the turns were left turns, they put maybe three on one side, on the right-hand side, and they'll put one on the other side. So at some place like Le Mans, where it's a lot of right turns, and there's actually only one left turn, which is Indianapolis, all of this is on the other side of the engine. Okay? You'll also find engines, when you get into the more sophisticated racing engines, where all of this is done internally, and there's only one, one place where it comes out. So they have, they have the, the circuitry for the, the scavenge oil pickup actually designed into the, the base plate of the, of the uh, of the crankcase bottom. 
Okay? So our oil is scavenged up to the, uh, the pump, and then we have to, oh, forgot here, we got to scavenge from somewhere else, and that is from valley the valley, because there's going to be oil hung up in here, and you want to scavenge that out as well. And that's where the five come from. Sometimes you'll also see scavenge points from the cylinder heads, depending on what kind of racing it is and what the stresses on the, the, the uh, uh, inertial stresses are on the, on the engine. So we scavenge it off, we send it up, there's a screen filter up there for taking out the boulders, and then we get into our oil cooler, and it goes back into our reservoir. But we're not finished yet, because what are we doing with this pump here? We're sucking oil out of the engine, right? And actually I'm getting ahead of myself, because there's one part we're going to show here first, and that is this tank has to breathe, okay? The tank has to breathe because the oil is now going to be hot and it's going to be full of air from going through all these pumps and being sucked around the engine. So the tank has to be able to breathe to deal with expansion of the lubricant as it increases in temperature. So we put a breather on, but it has to have a little catch tank because you're going to carry mist and you don't want that on the track. Okay, so there's always a catch tank somewhere in the system. Oh, this other point that I was trying to get to where I was getting ahead of myself. The engine has to breathe. Because often these suction pumps are actually sucking at a greater rate than what the delivery pump is delivering to the engine because you want to suck the oil out of the engine. Okay? So don't forget the breather line for the, for the engine crankcase and for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the oil tank. All part of the system. So fuel management systems, let's move on to that. And you don't have to read this whole chart here. The reason I'm showing you the chart is because a point that I want to make, what you've seen so far are diagrams. And diagrams help us to understand how things work through the use of pictures. But there's actually more information when you get into documentation in the written words than there may be in the diagrams. Because people don't have access to diagrams, but they may actually describe in the text. It's a fellow by the name of Ian Bamsey who writes a lot about engine, uh, racing engines. And most of his information actually comes from reading the text of his books as opposed to looking at the pictures. Okay, and what I wanted to show here was we have some different fuel injection systems that use different parameters for monitoring and, and controlling uh, the engine system, what we're talking about here is basically load. How do you measure load? Because that's an input to an engine management system. Some use manifold pressure, temperature, and volume. Some use mass of air and, and no other additional ones. Some work on the basis of a, a flapper door that measures the volume of air in cubic feet per minute. And it also looks at temperature barom and barometric pressure. Whereas racing applications tend to use throttle position, temperature, and barometric pressure. So somewhere in our engine management system, there should be something that measures throttle position and something that measures temperature and also the barometric pressure of the incoming air. There should be a sensor somewhere in the system. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm focusing on here. So if we look at, here's another picture of spaghetti. This is a typical passenger car uh, uh, engine management system from a corporation called Zytec. They, act, they also make racing systems, but this is what actually is in your car, and you've got a computer over here, and we're going to go through some of these things to give us an idea of what they are, but there's a few that we can eliminate for racing applications. Uh, emission control legislation requires us to control uh, evaporative emissions from the fuel system, and that's usually done with a charcoal canister and a whole control system for actually venting that back into the intake air so those vapors aren't going off into the atmosphere. And so let's was that one I just took out? See, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's go back, see what I took out. Oh yeah, we don't need exhaust gas recirculation in a racing car, because that's for controlling emission, for controls for emission legislation. So we can take that out. And we don't need our, our evaporative emissions control, as I said, and we don't need a secondary air pump to add air to the uh, to the exhaust pipe here to burn anything that's going through the catalyst. And we actually don't even need a catalyst in many cases, although there are some racing series that actually, actually do require you to keep the catalyst on. And now I eliminated another one that I wasn't thinking about. 
What was that? Oh, a differential pressure sensor, which is just measuring the pressure of the, of the vapor inside of the a fuel tank. That's all part of that charcoal canister return system. So let's get rid of that and get rid of all these other guys. And we're left with the, some of the primary things that we need for a racing engine. And we'll deal with the fuel system to start with. We have a tank and a pump and a filter and an injector. And these are usually continuous loop systems that take fuel from the tank to the injector and they're constantly returning any excess fuel back to the tank and it's all managed by the, uh, the fuel pressure regulator which is connected to the intake manifold. So they use intake manifold pressure to manage the fuel pressure in the line. That way when the, the amount of fuel that's injected is based only on when and how long the injector is open. Okay, so that's that part. Uh, what have we got here? We have our computer over here, which connects up, and the computer is going to tell uh, the injectors and the uh, the spark when to happen. But there's a lot of parameters and a lot of devices in the system for uh, actually telling the computer what to do. Inputs, and one of these is an idle speed sensor, which actually helps to bypass the throttle position sensor, give you the right amount of fuel when, uh, when you're at idle. So racing engines do differentiate between idle and, and when they're actually racing down the, down the road. Uh, what was next here? What came up? Body accelerometer on a passenger car, that's usually there for safety. On a racing car, it can be the same thing. But it can also um, have an impact on telling the computer what what, what actually the car is doing, it gives it another sense of is it accelerating or at constant speed and that may have an impact on what information it wants to send to the fuel injectors. Uh, what else we got here? Speed sensor, we need to know how fast the engine's going. Okay, that's an important input to the computer. It tells us how much fuel we have to add. A phase sensor, which usually runs off the camshaft. In old systems they used to use the speed sensor to run the same thing. But the, the, uh, the, the phase sensor tells the, uh, the computer which cycle they're in, whether it's the actual intake cycle or the exhaust cycle, so that it knows it only injects fuel every other time. Okay? And it's on the, it's on the camshaft because now we get rid of any delay in the drivetrain system going from the crank to the cam. Now, what did I highlight next here? Temperature sensor, coolant sensor. We want to know that. And what have I got here? The knock sensor. Not necessarily in every racing car, but in a lot of racing cars now. These, these are accelerometers that listen for the, the uh, vibration of knock, and they will retard the timing to protect the engine and make sure it's not knocking. Uh, what have we done next here? Lambda sensor, which is measuring, uh, measuring obviously the amount of oxygen in the exhaust, and Formula One cars do have lambda sensors on them to feed back to the computer information about how well the combustion in the cylinder is doing and what they're getting out of the exhaust so that it can go back and make adjustments to the fuel air ratio. Uh, an air temperature sensor, that was one of the ones that we saw in our previous, uh, previous slide where it talked about what the inputs were. Um, throttle position sensor. Tells how wide open the throttle is. And also the intake manifold pressure sensor, which was one of the parameters in our previous, the written slide that we saw before. Oops, and I pressed the button twice instead of once. So we put all of that all those inputs come in to the computer and then it sends the signals back to these two yellow guys up here which is the injector and the ignition coil to make it all happen at the right time. Okay, So when you're thinking about an engine management system you're going to see in a racing car these, these little black boxes but they all have to be connected. Th these sensors will be there somewhere. They should be. Wiring harnesses and that's kind of the next step. Uh, I'm going to hand a, I have a handout for you of a whole bunch of different websites and they're all uh, separated out by topic. Now often on the internet you can find 
electrical diagrams of uh, engine management systems, but as modelers, what we want to have is we want to have a wiring harness diagram because we're trying to get this into something like that so that we can create this in a more accurate fashion. Now, unfortunately, I can't explain to you exactly in this afternoon exactly how you go about doing that, but it's something that by giving you the information and the sources, it's a challenge for you to go away and, and maybe look some of these up and see how you might be able to translate what you see from a basic diagram, which will include fundamentally all of those uh, inputs and outputs that we talked about in the previous diagram. They'll be in this system somewhere. It's just a question of looking at your references to find them to understand how it goes together. Okay? So what's next here? Throttle linkages are uh, something that's important and they can get a little bit confusing because this is a champ car here, for instance, and you see a throttle linkage here. This particular one actually actuates the butterflies in each individual cylinder. However, you can see there's an extension here which goes back to another throttle linkage in the uh, intake to the, uh, to the plenum chamber. And depending on whether they're on a road course or a, uh, an oval, they will actually use different combinations of these. Sometimes they may not use the plenum throttle. Sometimes they just use the butterflies. Other times they just use the plenum throttle and not the butterflies. The plenum throttle is really to keep the pressure up inside the plenum chamber so the throttle response is better when they come back on the, on the gas. So something else to look for is, is additional throttle linkages that may, uh, may not be obvious. And just pointed those out here. So turbocharging, uh, I, I'm going to kind of assume everybody's familiar with how a turbocharger works. However, I must admit that I have seen uh, turbochargers wired with cooling lines going into the uh, exhaust turbine exit point. Um, on, uh, on some model cars and a few contests. Not, not, not here for sure, but a few other places. Anyways, the turbocharger is basically two fans. One's driven by the exhaust. It drives through a shaft to another one that uh, brings in air and compresses it, taking it into the engine. And there's some little journal bearings in here that have to be lubricated by lubricant. Um, this thing spins around 1,000 or 100,000 RPM or as high as that. Uh, and the exhaust bearing temperatures here can be a thousand degrees centigrade, which is very hard on the lubricant. Some of these have, and well let's look here, these are the major, uh, major turbocharger uh, manufacturers, uh, and they all have websites by the way, so you can look up, KKK is a little hard to find because it's been, I think it's been bought by Stuart, uh, not Stuart Warner, but uh, there's another company that's bought it, so it doesn't come up that way on the, on the web. But here's another turbocharger. Does anybody see anything unique about this particular turbocharger when we look at in here? Here's your intake side. Here's your exhaust side. There's four lines there because one is oil in, and we have an oil out, and we also have a coolant in and a coolant out. Water-cooled turbochargers are often used. This one happens to be from a Toyota uh, uh, Le Mans type car. And uh, they used water cooling quite a bit to cool the turbocharger. And sometimes that drives a whole separate cooling system from the cooling system for the rest of the engine. So something else to look out for. Turbocharging 2. Um, it's obviously that IndyCar engine again. We have the intake side and the exhaust side. And our waste gates here, which are used for controlling the pressure in the exhaust system, and they have their own little wiring system associated with them as well. Uh, if this is a typical waste gate, basically what we have is a uh, exhaust in, and internal there, there is a valve system, um, and there's also a diaphragm in here. And in the early days of turbocharging, the pressure at which the uh, wastegate would actually dump the exhaust um, was based on winding the spring in and out. So it was very much a manual thing and fixed for the duration of the race. Well, that, as turbocharging developed in the early 80s, um, they went on to a control system 
where they actually put uh, intake manifold pressure below, above and below the diaphragm and by using a bleed valve off of one of the lines they could actually adjust, the driver could adjust the uh, pop-off valve, not, this isn't pop-off valve, sorry, the, the wastegate pressure at which, uh, so you could turn the boost up and down. Pop-off valves are a little bit different, they're usually a rules device and there's not much to them, in the, at least in the manual ones, it sits on top of the plenum chamber. The only wire that you usually get from that is a tube that used to run up to the cockpit so the driver could hear when it was about to pop and it was actually a listening tube. Usually a little piece of blue hose off, light blue hose often. Okay, and there's a knob inside the, inside the cockpit where the, so there's a wire go, a hose going back, this hose actually would go back into the, uh, into the cockpit with a knob and a valve where the, the driver could actually turn and adjust it. Most of the uh, pop-off valves are uh, now electronic. Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, let's go on to brake systems. Um, Here's the front of, this is a little bit hard to see, I thought I'd lighten this up a, a bunch, but uh, this is the front of a right-hand drive uh, sports car, prototype sports car, and you can see here that we have some uh, liquid fluid cylinders over on this side of the engine, which is on the left side, so it's not unusual to find the master cylinders for your braking system and your clutch. Clutch is usually the small one, braking are the two big ones located differently from where you would expect to find the master cylinders, which actually are underneath here. There's an air jack in here, and there's a whole bunch of uh, electronic connections here that actually this particular car actually has power steering on it, so it's hard to see in this picture. And I just wanted to illustrate the fact that brake cylinder reservoirs don't have to be where the master cylinders are. In fact, here's some examples of uh, master cylinder setups from Tilton. And these are the control devices that they actually use for changing the brake balance, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and it's, it's clear in the next picture, but I just wanted to show you what the brake balance bar looked like. Um, you may or may not wish to model something like that, but there's an adjuster on here which actually moves this piece back and forth. And you'll see how that works in a moment. So if I come up with a brake system here, with some front and rear brakes and my master cylinder set up here. We're looking at this from the top. So here's our two master cylinders, our brake pedal, and this is the uh, brake balance bar that I was showing you previously. We'll connect up our front brakes and our rear brakes. You notice they're separate. The reason for that is because we want to be able to control brake pressure for front and rear separately. Okay, and the way they do that is by moving the brake balance bar back and forth put pressure on our pedal and we want it by turning the brake balance bar that red knob you saw in the previous photograph and that can have a, a wire or a, a cable going back up to where the driver is so that he can turn the knob himself there's also little push-pull plungers that you can do for adjusting it as well but it moves the brake balance collar back and forth across here so that you can adjust the brake balance from front to rear okay now there's one thing about this when I drew this picture that I f actually made a mistake is and that is that that the input for brakes isn't usually where the bleed valve is it's usually somewhere in the center of the of the uh, the caliper around about here there's usually a bleed valve at the top on both sides and you'll see there's some other pictures and some other pictures in a minute of the crossover pipe that's around the bottom another little detail that you could put in um, Here's a brake caliper and a rotor, and one of the other things that I've seen a couple of times um, about brakes, particularly when people use photo etch, is that, and photo etch is great stuff, and, and these are great, great models that I've seen. However, um, brake calipers are actually attached to the hubs, or the, the, the hub by something, and this is a neat little Porsche design because they actually pull, pull out from the hub so that you can pop the rotor off for changing the rotors. Uh, but I have seen in the past a couple of occasions where a caliper is attached glued to a rotor and the only other attachment point is the hose, which uh, doesn't work very well sometimes. Actually, after the first time, it doesn't work very well. So that's something else to think about. Is there an attachment point? 
And what I wanted to show you here was a variety of different types of, uh, of rotor faces. There's lots of different kinds, uh, different patterns. Let's bring some up here, have a look at them. Um, these little notches here are actually used for breaking up the gas that forms when the pad material vaporizes and it is supposed to prevent the pad from riding up on top of the gas that's generated and it actually relieves the pressure, air pressure as the pads going across the rotor face. So we've got notches, slashes, cross drilled. Uh, this is a one I only, this is one I've seen last year or the year before, so I hadn't seen that one before. That's a new one. This is a carbon fiber rotor and it has these three little notches in it, same purpose, but uh, a different approach. Uh, one thing to be aware of, there is some box art on some of the Tamiya models where they're showing a Le Mans car with cross-drilled brakes. Well, it was very unusual if uh, totally uncommon for them to actually use cross drill brakes at Le Mans. And the reason for it is, is that these, cross, these drilling points, which are used for lightning, uh, the, the brake rotor actually caused stress cracks, particularly on Mulsanne Strait, where the brake cools quite a bit from one corner to the next. Okay. So that's another little detail about what the difference is between what you might see and what is probably what should be there, okay? Another neat detail is you see the uh, temperature sensitive paint uh, painted on the end of that particular rotor there with, has, which has square holes in it. We were talking about something the other day in one of the other seminars and one idea that I had used was uh, on a model I did here last time was to actually print on the printer on a piece of paper the strip edge here and print on the holes, black dots, and print on the, the painted colors and just glued that on the edge of the rotor, which looked pretty real by the time you were finished, even though it maybe didn't have the, uh, the depth in there that you would have if you wanted to do, spend all your life drilling holes around the outside. Brake uh, ducting, there's, uh, it's not all orange. There's also silver black, and it does have this, this silver coil around it. And actually, I found on the Willwood brake site, they actually provide pictures on how to set up the braking ducting for your stock car. So there's a reference right there for you. Let's go on to shock absorbers. Um, there's different kinds of uh, shock absorbers. They get pretty sophisticated these days. But there's the plain ones that have fluid on both sides. And there's also the gas-filled ones where they put gas uh, above. Um, and then there's some that you'll see on a lot of racing cars where you have well, that didn't work very well. You'll see the, uh, these little reservoirs hanging off the side, either with a hose or with uh, a mechanically attached to the shock, shock of self. And what they're doing there is they're taking the, uh, some of the fluid and the gas outside of the shock absorber. It helps to cool, keep the, the fluid cooler so it's not as sensitive to uh, temperature changes, which will impact how the shock absorber works. Some shock absorbers are temperature compensating. But once again, a little bit different setup that you can look at in terms of how the shocks are set up. Uh, the other thing in terms of suspensions is, uh, and these are, this is a front suspension from a, a Champ car. There's, uh, obviously we have our shock absorbers up here. What else? Springs, gas reservoir. You can see this one has a tube on it and third spring. Now third springs are relatively new and I think everybody understands what these two guys do. They, they uh, provide your shock absorb and springing for both sides. But the third springs are, are only new in about the last five years or so and you can see a shock absorber here. And there's a rubber spring in here. It's just a rubber donut. Okay, and rubber does it, will act as a spring as well by itself. They also use them for bump rubbers to protect the end travel of the shock so that when it uh, gets to the end of the travel it's not smashing metal to metal. Um, so bump rubbers is something you can put into a shock absorber as well if you want to get into that kind of detail. But the third spring is actually, and there's the gas reservoir for the third spring, the third spring actually, actually um, manages when the car, when you put the brakes on and the car wants to dive, the front end wants to dive down. So they're now starting to actually manage that characteristic of the handling of the car separately from each wheel going up and down. Okay? And this particular one here, uh, 
connects down to the anti-roll bar, which is con uh, down near the foot pedal, which uh, controls the roll from side to side. So it may, when one wheel goes up, it transfers some of that, that motion to the other side to try and keep the car as... The, the idea here, here is you want to keep the car as level as possible so the aerodynamics are operating correctly underneath the car. See some other wires here. Um, this is a rotary suspension movement transducer. It actually is part of the, uh, the uh, PI data system, which um, measures the actual motion of the suspension system through a rotary device. It's gear, actually geared to, the, to, this, uh, to this bracket here that moves with the suspension, and it sends signals back. And they can actually monitor this live while the car is racing around the track. They can watch. In fact, like in Ferrari, they have one guy who just watches one wheel go up and down. What do we got here? Here's a rear suspension, and we have all of the things that we saw in our previous diagram, shocks, gas reservoirs, but the third spring now happens to have an actual metal spring in it. And can anybody think of what you'd want to have a third spring on the back for if the front spring is for dive? Squat when you accelerate, because that's going to have an impact on how you're going to get grip on the back end. And you also see the anti-roll bar down at the back there, which they're just torsion bars that manage the transferring the load from one side to the other. So what's next here? Suspensions three. Here's one that's a little bit different. This is from a Ferrari 333 SP. We've got our shock absorber. Our gas reservoir is hidden around the corner up there. And kind of unique here is that we have a hydraulic third spring. So the, the two shock absorbers are attached to a hydraulic cylinder that does the same action, controls that squat and dive that we talked about in the previous slides. And also a little bit different here, uh, there's the rod that goes to the anti-roll bar strut. And we have a linear transducer for measuring suspension movement. If you go look at the uh, Toyota GTP or uh, GT1 in there, the yellow or the red and the white one, the one with the tiger stripes on it, you can actually see that the modeler has put in linear transition, the linear suspension transducers on the rear suspension. They always look like little shock absorbers. So let's go on to hoses and fittings. Um, catalogs. Best place to learn about hoses and fittings is catalogs. And AeroQuip has one. I happen to get this one at a trade show, an industrial trade show. But you can actually download the latest catalog from the internet. <coughs> And it has lots of cool stuff in it about all the different kinds of hoses. Hoses aren't all metal braid. They're black. They're gray. They have different weaves and patterns on them. You can have steel over braids on top of the rubber hosing. And you can also have orange insulation. So none of these are, it's not incorrect if you see any of these colors on a, uh, on a, on a lubrication system or a system. And of course, we have our fittings here, different angles. They come in certain angles, like 120 degrees, 180 degrees, 90 degrees, 30 degrees, so that if you really want to get uh, detailed about it, you can make sure they're all legitimate angles. Now, did anybody notice anything? This is a modeling question. Did anybody notice anything about that last slide? Yeah. And what do you think that means? Nope. You're right. Let's reorder them here. We've got some that have blue elbows and some that have red elbows. And that's because they're two different manufacturers. Okay? Goodrich have blue elbows and AeroQuip have red elbows. <laughs> and then you can also find... Oops, went too fast there. There's a company called i -Corps. Uh, that has gold and gold with blue elbows. <laughs> so there's lots of, and when you look at your reference material, you'll see these things and you'll say, well, why, is that, why isn't that red and blue? It's because it's a different manufacturer. Okay, and that's another detail you can bring out in your modeling. There's also different kinds of fittings in addition to the AN type that we just showed. There's, there's fixed elbows, T's, female T's, male T's, and there's also a neat little chart in the catalog that gives you the actual sizes of uh, 
of the fittings in terms of the pipe thread size and the AN fitting size to help you pick and choose what sizes you might like to use on different systems. There's another type of uh, connector that you often see in racing cars which is the Adel Wiggins connector and it actually has two pipes, an internal collar and this little collar here has the little, this little hinge clasp on it that actually closes the whole thing. You'll see that on Formula One cars. And of course, to actually use those, uh, syst this system to attach up to other things, they have a silver and purple system that connects um, with this type of a connector to a hose connection. Okay, so you'll see some of those. I've modeled these before by just wrapping some uh, bare metal foil around a uh, coolant pipe and then painting it purple. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to get the latch, but uh, I don't have quite that much time on my hands. Good, good point. I like that. Oh, it's time for a story again. Um, there was a young uh, mechanic or a young student of mechanics that w went uh, down, to, young fellow went down to the local garage and he'd lost a part for his car. And he went in and he said, I've lost my 710. And the proprietor of the service station said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, well, I've lost my 710. I don't have one. It's gone. He says, so he called out to the guys in the garage and he says, uh, he says, any guys ever heard of a 710? And they all said no. So there was a car with the hood up. So they took him out in the garage and they said, well, can you point out what the seven, this 710 that is missing? Took him up to the car and they said, well, it's right there. Can't you see it? 710. So with that, it's time for the test. And what I've got here is I happen to find, and I hope this is going to show up as well as it, what it could, because it's, it's better on the screen that I can see, that it's a little bit better than the one that you can see. Well, but it, it might actually, yes. Um, it's the one on the far left-hand side there with the light on. If you just press the switch, <coughs> and press the switch itself. There we go. Um, this is a, what I tried to do was pick a formula car that happened to have a North American engine in it. And I, at one travel I had somewhere, I happened to take a picture of the Buick V6 from the Indy Lights car. And this is an Indy Lights car with a Buick V6. And what I was hoping to do, we've got about 15 minutes or so left here, actually a little bit more than that, was let's go through and see how good we are in terms of uh, pointing out some uh, some uh, elements that we're looking at. Does anybody have any idea? What